uh, you can ask to be enlightened about this principle, about the reality of what is God. But you can't come up and say, well, the onus of a burden of proof is on you to prove there is a God. Because those who affirm there is a God are having an experience of it. Right? In various levels, various degrees, but they're having an experience. Right? Sometimes it's also accused because that experience is subjective, therefore it is not provable. You understand? Or it's not demonstrable. Right? You can't demonstrate it. Right? Because it's subjective. But actually, there is a subjective experience, but also looking throughout the course of history for thousands of years, if not millions of years, and looking at vast amounts of people covering every race, creed, color, ethnic, uh, ethnicity, social status, cultural arrangement, all have a belief in a supreme being and a methodology of honor and worship for a supreme being. So now you're not looking at a subjective experience, but an objective phenomenon which you'd have to account for. The majority of the world's population, which is somewhere between seven something billion and eight billion, the majority by poll believe in the nature of a supreme existence, right, supreme being. Therefore, you're looking at the majority uh, experience of being something related to a divine being. So actually, atheism is actually a very extraordinarily minority position. Right? So I don't want to repeat the whole thing that I, re that I spoke already in the first two, but I want to come to our point for today. I left off in the final video speaking about the things where atheistic material science has been unable to breach, and therefore it gives rise to the nature of atheistic science. And the first thing is <clears throat> observation of life, which is consciousness. At this point, empirical science, atheistic science, accepts that life is really a biochemical phenomenon. And actually, they have all the, bio, uh, the biology and chemistry, so obviously if you had everything, why isn't that we can't reproduce life? Or at least stop the non-existence of life, which would mean to stop death. But they can't do either one of these things, beginning from whatever they want to claim science began. They've not been able to do either one of these things, to stop death or create life. You understand? Not, not without having already the living organism. You understand? So they cannot create life, they cannot stop death. Therefore, they have to admit that life is something more than a biochemical phenomenon. But they refuse to do that. Actually, they identify consciousness as the hard problem. <laughs> Just think about that. They give it a nomenclature, they call it the hard problem. But it's not really a hard problem, because if you go into the elementary studies of any spiritual tradition, tradition anywhere in the world, you will see that the first thing they do accept is the existence of a soul and the expression of the soul, or ru in some religions, ori in other traditions, atma in Sanskrit, right? all relate to the idea of the seat of consciousness. You understand? So every religious tradition in its base teaching has the idea of a seat of consciousness called the Atma, Ru, Soul, you know, various nomenclature, but they have a seat of something from where consciousness emanates, and this consciousness is the visible perception of life in a physical body. You understand? Why do I say the visible perception? Because it's the absence of consciousness hmm, that determines whether we are alive or dead. It's not, a, it's not an absence necessarily of biochemistry. Because all the biochemistry may be there, but the activating principle, which is consciousness, is what is missing. Causing the difference between a living and a dead body. So, until and unless they come to the point, and it's happening. Really right now, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the other video as well, on multiple fronts, from multiple scientific disciplines, they are coming to the conclusion we can no longer uh, look at the science itself and conclude there is one, not an intelligent origin to existence, to creation, and life itself, and secondly, that there must be something anti-material 
which we have not been able to put under our empiric observation, which is the actual cause of life, etc. So all of those studies are coming out, all of those, the thrust of that kind of movement, uh, intelligent design, consciousness studies, has all started to take a very uh, deep thrust in the scientific community. Now, because science for the last, maybe late 1800s up to this period, has been completely dominated by atheism in many ways, there's a great degree of pushback on that. They don't want to include it as being scientific because they want to limit the scientific model to what can be empirically studied. But actually, the whole basis of existence is not just physical. Therefore, you cannot just empirically study everything. There are things beyond the purview of empiricism. And <clears throat> because they have not reached the ability to digest that fact, they don't apply even extended scientific methodology to trying to understand what is the consciousness and perhaps what is the soul. At this stage of the game, actually many scientists believe that the entire process of thinking, feeling, and willing are functions of neurological brain activity. Right? So of course, <laughs> there's no logic to that. We can understand that the brain has many neurological functions, obviously, and much of the function of the brain is not causative, but reactive. It reacts to stimuli, right? It is not generally causative. It usually reacts to some stimuli. So when you come to speaking about emotions, right? Love, hate, faith, anger, so forth, so on, right? The, the emotion that generates that is not a neurological function of a brain. The brain is reacting to the emotional content that's being manifest. You understand? And therefore the brain gives the neurological reactions and it may express itself physically and so forth and so on. But the brain itself is not the causative element in emotional content or in purpose. Like somebody, my purpose in life. That's not generated from the brain. That's generated from consciousness, and consciousness is generated from the soul, and the soul is undergoing an active experience of karmic iterations one after another. So of course, I've, I've jumped way ahead of the game because until science can even digest the idea of consciousness, they can never get to the seat of consciousness, nor will they be able to explain the diversity uh, outside of trying to couch it as just simply DNA, <laughs> phenomenon in, in people, but no, there's actually a karmic DNA profile, right? There's actually an individual karmic DNA that each soul has. And then when you start looking at the logic behind that, that that karmic DNA would be the basis under which each individual person could have an individual circumstance in a given karmic iteration means one life to another. If we take the so-called atheistic scientific model and say everything is simply biochemistry, and when the biochemistry uh, under the influence of time uh, wears out, that's just it. It was a wrap. There's nothing else. There was no teleological input. Teleology means like purpose. So there was no purpose or method to the madness, so to speak, of this human life. It just was a 60, 70 year phenomenon of biochemistry and uh, neurological brain activity, and when it's all finished, that's it, it's done. That is such a ridiculous proposal. Because then it doesn't address the diversity of everyone's experiences. If we're all starting from base zero, shouldn't everybody start on the same platform in any given iteration? Karmic iteration means one life to another? So there's no, obviously no explanation they can come up with for that. Right? Except it's the luck of the draw, I guess, is what their idea is. Right? So essentially, consciousness is the key. When we understand consciousness, then we can understand something of the existence of the human condition and human life. Then we can do a deeper explanation, exploration. What is the seat of that consciousness? Because it's not coming from the body. In fact, it is giving life to the body. According, obviously, to Vedic conception, 
uh, it's described. Atma pranadharani. Atma pranadharani means that the atma itself is dharan means to hold. So it's holding in place the pranic activity. Pran means the light airs, the essential light airs, which uh, course throughout the entire body. They derive consciousness or energy from the soul, and it's called vyapt. Vyapt means to permeate. So then it permeates the entire body with consciousness. So the Vedic cosmology, thousands and thousands of years ago, understood all of these things. Another thing they could do is look back and say, listen, if back at that time, in Srimad Bhagavatam, if you read in the third canto, there's description of time from the atom, which means atomic theory must have been understood back then. Also, it's quoted, uh, Andanta Paramanu Chayantra Saham, that God is in every atom. So the understanding of an atom was present there. One of the things I began to hit on in the last video, and I'm going to expound on a little bit here, right, this is a very short video, by the way, because I really have my mind set on <laughs> becoming absorbed in Gaur Kata, Gaur Lila, etc. But I brought up the point that we know that the indivisible part of all uh, material arrangement is the atom, right? Now there's parts to an atom and all that kind of stuff, but the finest indivisible part of all material creation is the atom. So when we ask, well, what is the atom and what's the power in the atom, people say, well, you have proton, uh, protons, uh, neutrons, and electrons, right? So we say that's all good, but then if you look, you can historically trace out when people came up with the names to identify those particular functions of the atom. But it doesn't describe what is the power. It's only a nomenclature to describe what you observed. But what is that power? We say that power is God. We have a statement, Andantra Paramanu Chayantra Shtam, that God is saying, I am in every atom of the creation. Therefore, I gave the argument uh, in the second video, and I think at the end of the first as well, that whenever we're having discussions with atheists, we should not even attempt to present a argument and a debate for the, for the existence of God in the transcendent position. Because they can never digest that unless they take to the methodology which reveals transcendence to them. But we can adequately argue you don't have to have transcendent experiences, transcendental experiences to realize God. Open your eyes and look at everything around you. It is God. Chapter Shloki Bhagavatam, Hameva Shameva Gri, Nanyat Sarasat Paramam, Pastaraham Yaritat Cha, Yogishita Shashmiyam. Krishna says, before the creation I existed. During the creation only I exist. <laughs> this is a statement that Krishna Shakti, by his energy, he's everywhere in every atom. So there is nothing which is outside the purview of God. So we don't need to prove a transcendent, supernatural position of God. Nature itself is God. Tenth canto of Bhagavad Gita. I am the sun and the moon. I am the stars. I am the taste in water. So next time any atheist approaches you about proof of God, tell them to go get a drink of water and come back and talk to you. <laughs> so the whole idea is that there is no escaping the existence of God. So you have to have an anti-religious, because the word religion means religio, means almost the same as yoga, to bind back to one's creator. You understand? So they're simply doing anti-religion. It's a faith they have because it's a faith. Everything they do is also faith-based. They have faith that everything is biochemistry. They have faith that the entire creation was generated from a uh, cosmic soup that was struck by lightning and then there was uh, the you know uh, prototype cells which then grew in complexity and eventually life form. That's all faith because nobody observed that. It's all conjecture and faith. And then it's also deduction, because you can do modern experiments and look back and say, well, this could have happened, that could have happened. The entirety of Darwin's theory is really a lot of conjecture. Even the most modern science apparatus was not available to Darwin necessarily, right? So everything he was doing was from what was available in that time period, and much of it was just his idea of building a deductive reasoning. Well, look, you can see that the 
bone structure in this particular species is very similar to the bone structure in that species. So theoretically, it could be possible that this species, in order to adapt to its environment, became this species. Problem is now they're discovering that you don't find missing links, they call it, between those two species. You also don't find where you've actually witnessed or had the experience that one species turns into another. We don't see it. We see inner species or interspecies, not inner species, not interspecies, interspecies adaptation, right? Because they bring up the idea of one bird called a finch. And you can see variations in this bird. But that's within the same species. You understand? But you don't see cats turning to dogs, dogs turning into cows. We don't see that. Right? And we don't certainly see that apes have turned into humans. We just don't see it. So it was a theory based mostly in conjecture, but it won favor at the time, backing at the time, and it became an excellent foundation to separate completely from the auspices and patronage of the church and take up an, an entirely secular position as far as science was concerned. And now we have a theory of how everything happened. We're not dependent on in the first day, God created the heavens and the earth, etc. Because that's what they were fighting against. And even I've told many people who are friends of mine who are Christians, if you're having this debate, you have to be able to understand yourself what is ontology, what is narrative, and what is a, uh, what we would call in Sanskrit, Siddhanta. So the Bible is actually ontologically absolutely correct. That God separated the heavens and earth, that God said let there be light, that God uh, created life, you understand? Now if you start looking at the, mm, you know, in seven days this happened, so forth and so on, you have to go into some kind of exegesis as far as Christianity is concerned and find out what those terms mean. What was one day according to the conception at that time? Just like in Vedic cosmology, we have a Kalpa, we have a day of Brahma, you understand? We have days related to human life. So if you wanted to do a deep dive to try to understand all of the you know, cosmology of Christianity, you could probably do that. But I'm saying that in presenting the basic argument, ontologically it's correct. Because all it's originally saying, right, and that's any tradition, is that the original genesis of the entire creation with all of its uh, obviously uh, intelligent design features was in fact produced by an intelligent designer. You understand? And therefore, again, in proving the existence of God, I've given many things. One is that um, you couldn't have the discussion if there was nothing that was in existence. Because the human faculty cannot create something from nothing. And that's what they're suggesting. They're suggesting that the idea of God is something created from human intelligence or consciousness. But human intelligence and consciousness cannot create something that does not exist. You understand? So I'm giving an example. I've asked many times to name something that doesn't exist. So then people usually put together some combination of things which they have no experience of. A pink flying elephant. But when you really analyze the statement, there's not one thing they mention there that's not in existence. The color pink exists. Flight exists and elephants exist. We've not seen that in our experience, but then again, we're not omniscient and omnipotent, therefore we've not had every single experience. You understand? So the point would be to bring up something which uh, absolutely and completely, right, does not exist. You can't name even an element of existence. So name something that doesn't exist. You cannot do it. Because the human faculty is part of the, cre the human faculty is part of a creation, it is not the creator. You understand? We're not creators, we're part of the creation. Right? In Paramatma Sandhava, Jeeva Goswami Pai uh, says, in the 21 qualities of the Atma, he says, Paramatma Seishito. Paramatma Seishito means we are the Seish, it means we are the last part of the energy called Jiva Shakti coming from Paramatma, for those who are in the conditioned world, right? So they are the last of the expansion of the Jiva Shakti or Jiva Tattva coming from Paramatma, you understand? So we are created phenomenon, we're not creators, you understand? 
So there's just so many ways to go about uh, couching the arguments for theistic mm, presentations without having to try to debate the transcendental position of God. Understand? And again, which was my point for today, and I think I'm going to wrap up here. We have a lot to do. Uh, my, my point here today was that bridge, which I ended in the last video and I'm finishing here, is consciousness. Because that's going to be the first entrance into any kind of understanding beyond the simply empirical. If they cannot get to the point where they solve the hard problem, which is called consciousness, which if they really want it solved, you could easily turn to those who understand consciousness. <laughs> right? But part of the, you know, part of the, what is it? Um, the dogma of atheistic science is that it can never turn towards religious thought. That's part of the dogma. You know, and of course this goes back to the scientific revolution, as I mentioned earlier, in the late 1800s, 1900s, where the, you know, sort of secular sciences and even philosophy and so forth separated from the church. Right? You have to go back and look at the story of Copernicus and then later to Galileo and others, right? And how that shaped contemporary science. Right? So, again, I think if you do end up having these discussions for any reason, hopefully not during this period, which is coming towards Gorpening, then if you look at those three videos, there's ample ammunition there for presenting the case. And there's nothing in those arguments that can actually be defeated by atheists. So they will simply have to admit, at best, I just don't believe in God. And as soon as you say the word, I don't believe in God, you're making a declaration of faith, so your faith is anti-theism. <laughs> right? That's all it is. It's just your faith. It's not any scientific principle, has nothing to do with science, in fact. Right? Atheism is a personal, mental idea. Right? It has nothing to do with science. Right? Because they try to link the two things because they want the foundation of saying, well, look at all we've produced. Right? We've, of course, sophisticated... Uh, the process of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending for the most part, but, you know, taking the good things. And science is not bad, so I also don't want that idea that, and that seems to have been the sort of way that this whole thing began. There are many devotees who are obviously either scientists, interested in science, working in the fields of science, and they want to feel that there's some connection between bhakti and their science. And when they are confronted by the preference and priority given to Guru Sadhu and Sastra, sometimes that becomes difficult for them because it butts heads with their material view of science. So then they try to say, well, it's because devotees are unaware or uneducated in the field of science. But actually that's not the fact, right? Even though every devotee is not a scientist or has studied the field of science, people do have common sense and people are not completely uneducated. People went to school, people went to college, and it was in many cases comparative understanding between what they've understood or realized in the practice of their religion, and in our case, in the practice of bhakti, versus what explanations about the existence of life, origins of life, were offered by modern material atheistic science. So it's not at all a matter of being uneducated around science, it's a matter of being educated in science enough to know when you make a comparative study, the idea of something coming from nothing, like abiogenesis, right? Or that looking at the complexity of cellular structure that we know now and thinking that all of that developed from a simple prototype of a cell that came from some kind of primordial soup, it just, the logic and the science doesn't add up. It's not a matter of religious thought. The science itself doesn't add up. If, they, if you knew... Uh, for a lot of devotees speaking, just if you understand how complex a cell is, the amount of coding it takes in the DNA, right, this eight-letter eight, uh, eight letter code, so to speak, that creates the amino acids, that create proteins, which are the building blocks. This is phenomenal stuff. That obviously also the tolerances involved in all of that, what to speak of in physics, the tolerances that are involved in keeping the whole gravitational field in place, and allowing everything not to crash into each other, how could you 
conjecture or come up with the idea, well, that all just happened by happenstance. We would not accept that under any other condition of empirical experience. If I bring a person an iPad and say, listen, yeah, I just walked in, there was some glass, there were some uh, chips, and there was a covering, and I came back, it was all together as an iPad. I would either be recommended to talk to a psychiatrist, or people would ask me about my drug use. You understand? So what kind of ridiculous idea is it that everything else in our uh, empirical experience, right, that shows design, order, uh, symmetry, everything, just came out of chaos. <laughs> that is just not, it doesn't make sense, right? And it doesn't matter how much you bolster your posture by trying to back it by, well, I'm, I have a PhD in this. Well, the, that stamp is not equating to actual knowledge in this case. Because if there's no common sense, how can there actually be knowledge what to speak of wisdom? Right? There's a theory called Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor means, generally for most people, the most basic answer is normally the right answer. Of course, it's more expanded than that. It means the simplest answer that covers the most explanation of the phenomenon is the right answer. That's the theory of Occam's Razor. You understand? It's not just the simplest answer, but it's the answer that most completely covers the topic and is the simplest. You understand? So, the simplest, most complete understanding of the origin of life, existence, the cosmos, with everything we empirically experience on a day-to-day -day basis, is that there's an intelligent designer. That life itself is an anti-material phenomenon. And that begins our entrance into the domain of anti-material uh, energy, which is consciousness. And then we can start looking at the seed of that consciousness, the nature of what is the teleology or purpose for the existence of both that seed of consciousness, the soul, consciousness itself, even the teleology of the temporal existence. Because one uh, argument that atheists get, well, if God is the designer, why did he create everything temporary that people have to die? That speaks to the teleology of human existence. There's a purpose to human life. And therefore, the amount of time allotted is so that you can try to fulfill that, and at a certain point when that is unfulfilled, that is curtailed, and then you pick up again in another iteration, depending on your karmic portfolio, to again try to fulfill the proper purpose of life. Of course, they're going to say that's more in the theological domain, and therefore it's not scientific, but who cares what they think, <laughs> quite frankly, right? And the, the point is there's so many scientists who are working very hard to bring back the synthesis of God consciousness and observation of the glory of God's creation by uh, understanding it, discovering various things. There's no harm in any of that. And especially when it produces good for mankind. Understand? There's no harm in it whatsoever. But simply to make science a standard that everybody has to be educated in and at the same time remove any principle of God from it is not advancement of culture, it's actually the regression of culture. Because if you look at all the cultures of antiquity, they synthesize science and God. So I'm going to leave it there because I do have some other services to do. And also, I will get ready for our phone conference tonight to glorify Shri Ishpara Puripad. And also Shivaratri is coming up on Saturday. So uh, we'll probably start to go into some Understanding of Shiva Sattva as well. All right, my Dandavat Pranam devotees. Jai, Vanchakal Patrivisha, we push in the way which are, Patitana Pavanavu, Vaishnavi Vu Namo Namaha, Jai Radhe Radhe.